Hi, everyone. Oh, look, it's 830. So if you have your candle, I'm about a light for everybody. So tonight is the yard side of Menachem Mendel from Vitebsk. We're going to hear all, learn all about him. But let me light my candle. Menachem Mendel ben Rav Moshe. Should have an Aliyah Neshama. His merit, we should have the Geula Shalema, Tachia Sameisim, and Olivia says Amen. Yes, so I have my candle. That's very nice. Okay. So I do have a little, um, I wasn't able to speak on Shabbos. Now my voice has come back. Baruch Hashem, more or less, not completely. And I have, I took 12 pages of notes this afternoon. I Googled Menachem Mendel of Atebsk, and I took 12 pages of notes, which I'm very excited to share with you. So we'll see how it goes between the time and my voice, how much we get accomplished. Okay. <clears throat> so when I Googled, so it's Menachem Mendel, then Moshe, and his, his only son was named Moshe also after his father. But there's so much to say, I guess we'll have to begin. Okay, so the first place, when if you Google something, I got to see a couple of things from Wikipedia, even Times of Israel, Sephora, then Chabad.org, and finally, Inra, Rav Ginsburg. And that's how we'll end with Rav Ginsburg, said of Menachem Mendel, Rav Menachem Mendel of the text, Shul in Tavaria a couple of years ago. Okay, so that was my telling you what I'm going to tell you, and now I'm going to tell you. I'm happy to see that Jill has her, her camera on and Bracha, but could a few more people put their cameras on? Come on, it does add a lot, especially for poor horse person to see those enthusiastic faces. Come on. All right. So, so Nacha Mendel of Vitebsk. Vitebsk, by the way, is in Belarus, Belarus, White Russia, an exciting place to be. He was born in 1730 in Vitebsk, and he passed away 1788 in Tveria. But a lot of things happened between those two dates. And you know, the name Menachem, the next year, 1788, Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk passed away in Eretz Yisrael. But Semach Tzedek, the third Lubavitch Rebbe, was born in, one year later in 1789. And his father, the Mittler Rebbe, and his grandfather, the Alter Rebbe, named him Menachem Mendel after Menachem Mendel of Atebsk. So if you were wondering, how did that name become so popular in Chabad? Now you know the answer. It's after Menachem Mendel of Atebsk, who was the teacher of the Alter Rebbe, as we shall see, step by step. So Menachem Mendel was the primary chassid of the Magid of Mezrich, who was the primary student of the Baal Shem Tov. And Menachem Mendel spread Hasidus throughout Belarus and Lit 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 Lithuania. And his primary book, we'll speak more about it, is called Pre Haaretz, The Fruit of the Land, which he wrote after he arrived in Eretz Yisrael. Okay, so let's see how it all works out. Um, in 1772, Menachem Mendel went went with the Alter Rebbe, who regarded Menachem Mendel as his Rebbe. After the Magid's passing, they went together to the Vilna Gaon to convince him to rescind his ban on Hasidus, but the, the Gaon wouldn't receive them. He had heard Lush and Har about Hasidus. Here they ate on, on Tisha B'Av. That was because Tisha B'Av came out on Shabbos that year, etc. So they did want to make peace. The, the Vilna, Gron had, Vilna Gron had sent out a proclamation signed by his students that it was forbidden to marry Hasidim, drink their wine, or and you weren't responsible for their blood, whatever that might mean. And actually, all the students of the Gon, except for Chaim Avalovich, signed it. And when they went to get Chaim Avalovich's signature on this lovely proclamation, um, proclamation. He didn't want to sign it. And the emissary who came to him said, but in your 
in the, in the in the Gon's book, you refer to him as Malach Elohim, an angel of God. Why won't you sign his proclamation? And Chaim of Elijah answered that when Hashem told Abraham to sacrifice his son Yitzhak, Hashem himself came and told him. But when, when it was time to say, never mind, don't sacrifice, and he just sent an angel. So an angel is good to say, don't do it, but God forbid to spill Jewish blood. It has to come directly from Hashem. So Chaim of Elijah did not sign this proclamation. They did try to get him to rescind it, but it didn't work out. But don't worry, things are much better nowadays that even in the, in the Snagdisha summer camps, the children sing Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is truly everywhere. So we've made a lot of progress in these last 300 years or so. Okay, so in 1777, along with Avram Kalisker and 300 followers, he emigrated to Eretz Yisrael, Menachem Mendel of Ateps, settling first in Sfat, which was part of Ottoman Syria. Can you imagine making Aliyah in 1777? This was the first mass Aliyah, the first mass emigrating to Eretz Yisrael. In, in 1783, they moved to Tveria. Apparently Menachem Mendel said the winds in Sfat kept him up at night. He wasn't able to sleep. So he moved to Tveria, and it is a shul that he built there in 1786 that still stands. And we had the schuss of hearing Rabbi Yitzhak give a class in this very shul that's still standing. And the Tanya is partially based on the teachings of the Nachum Mendel of the text. How do you spell, someone in Esther is writing, how do you spell the name of the person you speak about? So Menachem and Mendel, you can spell as they sound. And Vitebsk is a city in, still today in white Russia, not far from Lubavitch. And I guess I would spell it V-I-T-E-B-S-K. Vitebsk, Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk, who's buried in today. Okay, so as the Tanya is, since he was one of the Alta Rebbe's major, major teachers, the, the Tanya is partially based on the teachings of Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk. So we have the candle burning for his yurt site. Okay. So um, at age nine, Menachem Mendel was introduced to the Baal Shem Tov by his father, Reb Moshe, who was a chassid of the Baal Shem Tov. I see I have further notes on this meeting on page five. Uh-huh. So Menachem Mendel's father traveled each year from Vitebsk in Belarus to Mezhebush, today the Ukraine. At the age of nine, Menachem Mendel was deemed strong enough to accompany his father on this grueling journey. And finally, he met the Baal Shem Tov we had heard so much about. And then as he grew up, he was, he was able to travel to Mezhebush to the Baal Shem Tov alone. One year he arrived on Friday at noon and checked into the local inn. The Besht always started Shabbos early. And this week the Baal Shem Tov appeared to be waiting. And when Menachem Mendel quietly slipped in, the Baal Shem Tov began the davening. And it was clear that the Baal Shem Tov was waiting for him. Okay, so hold that thought in mind. We're gonna get back to that story but it does sound exciting. Okay. After the Magid, the Masrit of, the Magid of Mezrich Estalkos, many thousands of Hasidim thronged to Menachem Mendel of the Teps, including the Alta Rebbe. And after the Magid, Menachem Mendel moved to Haradok near the Teps. Some people actually call him Menachem Mendel of Haradok, but our custom is to call him Menachem Mendel of the Teps. That's where he was born. The Hasidic Aliyah contributed significantly to the revival of the Galil at that time, bringing 300 Jews at that time under the Ottoman Syrian Empire in 1777 was a very big deal. So Priha Aretz, the fruit of the land, which I think is an excellent name for a safer, 
for, for a book, for a book of poetry, for a book of Hasidus, the fruit of the land, pre arts. It contains his reflections, his letters, his commentaries. And he maintained that Menachem Mendel remained in steady contact with his Hasidim in Europe through letters. Much of the letters are based on Kabbalah. And he was a pioneer in the movement to return to Zion. We should make a Lachayim on that. Return to Zion. Okay. So um, 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 while he lived in Svat, oh, this is a famous story. And now you'll know it's about Menachem Mendel of Atevsk. So while he lived in Svat, he heard a big commotion in the street and he sent someone to inquire what was going on. And apparently some slightly Meshuggah person had blown a, a chauffeur on Har Hazan on, on the Mount of Olives and said, Mashiach has come. And so they told, the servant came back and told Menachem Mendel, the commotion is because Mashiach has arrived. And Menachem Mendel opened his window. He took a sniff. And then he shook his head in the negative and came back in, put his head back into the room. So how the story is explained is that when his room was already in a Mashiach state. The outside world was not. Menachem Mendel had achieved the spiritual level of awareness of godliness that Mashiach will reveal. So even in this time, he was able, he was aware of the spiritual level that Mashiach will reveal. And he had a sniff outside to see if Mashiach had actually come. That is a cool story, right? Okay, so Menachem Mendel longed for communion with Hashem. You know, I guess a lot of us, that's why we're gathered. <laughs> gathered together tonight because we're longing for communion with Hashem. So he, he was also, and he believed that Eretz Yisroel was a move to a propitious site for this communion. He felt Eretz Yisroel, if you're looking to commune with Hashem, Eretz Yisroel is a good choice. He had a network of Shaderi, which were emissaries who brought letters back and forth from Eastern Europe to Eretz Yisrael with the donations that the European Hasidim, who really weren't very rich at that time, gave. A lot of the letters in the Alter Rebbe's Tanya and Agaris HaKodesh are speaking about giving tzedakah to Eretz Yisrael, you might notice when we get to that part of Tanya. And it was so that it was all should be organized that when the shluchim, the emissaries came from Menachem Mendel to bring money back to Eretz Yisrael, that all the communities should have it organized so they could just come to one place in each town, pick up all the donations and bring them back to Eretz Yisrael. Because even though it was pretty hard to get by, at least there was a chance to have a Parnas and Eretz Yisrael at that time, it was extremely difficult. Okay, so Menachem Mendel spoke, there's a quote in Chumash that it's a land, the Eretz Yisrael is a land that devours its inhabitants. It eats its inhabitants. Other lands, the inhabitants eat from the land. But in Eretz, <laughs> I find that funny, you see. But in Eretz Yisrael, the land eats the inhabitants. So that's such a great thing. <laughs> that we get consumed by the land, we become part of the land. What a deal. That sounds like a good thing. <laughs> Just shoot up by the land, and here we are, post-chewing, but maybe it's a constant process. Okay, so pre arts appear, the book appeared for the first time in 1814, and it's Hasidic teachings on the Parsha and on the holidays. Okay, now, um, a few things, you know, today is, is Aleph, tonight in Eretz Yisrael, tonight, tomorrow, tonight and all over the world, but we're already at the night, is all of, of Rosh Chodesh. It's two days Rosh Chodesh. Today during the day was Lamed. Today is all of the first day of the new month. And one of the sources that came up on Chabad.org that spoke about him also gave the other exciting things that happen tonight, tomorrow. So I'm just gonna share, you, share them with you free of charge. So today, Rosh Chodesh Iyar is when the Jews were counted in the desert in the second year 
after our departure from Mitzrayim, the Jews wow. recounted. Number two, it was the passing of Yaakov Beira, who passed away in 1546. He's one of the people that left, had to leave Spain in 1492 when we were all expelled from Spain. He was one of the people that came to Tzvat. And he was one of the Kabbalists there in the time, the exciting time of the Ariza. He made efforts to reinstate smicha, like becoming a rabbi that was about, you know, originally it was a hands-on kind of smicha, it actually means that, hands-on from Rebbe to disciple, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't reinstated. It had been stopped in the fourth century because of Roman persecution, that personal type of becoming a rabbi. Three, it's the passing of the Hachem Tzvi in 1718. He wrote a book of Halach by that name, Hachem Tzvi. Okay, he passed away in Europe. And the last thing, of, it's the passing of Shmuel Shmelki of Nicholsburg in 1788. He was the brother of Rabbi Pinchas of Frankfurt, who's buried in Frankfurt. And these two brothers were the first Hasidim to hold rabbinical posts in Germany. So it was a really big deal. The first two Hasidim to be official rabbis in Germany. Hasidus is spreading. This is 1718. Okay. So there was a renowned mashpia who's often quoted Rabbi Grunem Esterman, who says the all pervading truth of Hashem was already a tangible reality in his room. That's how he explains that in his room, if Menachem Mendel inhaled there, he would smell Mashiach. He had to go to the outside to sniff that Mashiach hadn't come in the world because the all-pervading truth of Hashem was a tangible reality in his room. Okay. So, um, mm -mm -mm. so we spoke about, okay, so just, this idea. So we spoke about how the Baal Shem Tov started that Shabbos early, and he was waiting. Um, the Baal Shem appeared to be awaiting because uh, for Menachem Mendel to enter, and because that's when he began the davening. And it was clear that the Baal Shem Tov waited for him. Then the Baal Shem Tov told a mysterious story to three people: his three top Hasidim, Menachem Mendel of Bateps, the Magid, and Yaakov Yosef of Polnoy. A mysterious story. Okay. And the Baal Shem Tov said to the Magid, inside he's truly humble and absolutely subservient before Hashem. Because the, the Menachem Mendel had a, he wore like, he dressed like a king. He wore silk garments, smoked a pipe. So, um, but, so even though outside he looked like a king, the Baal Shem Tov told the Magid, inside he's truly humble and absolutely subservient before Hashem. And after the passing of the Magid of Mezerich, Menachem Mendel became one of the greatest Hasidic masters, teacher of the Alter Rebbe. <clears throat> Menachem Mendel once fell, fell seriously ill. He was surrounded by Hasidim and his family praying for him. It was looked pretty bad. It was looking very serious. And suddenly, like he awakened and said, there's nothing to fear. Based on the Baal Shem's Tov story, I have to go to Eretz Yisrael. So my time has not come. When, when this story was told, when the story was told, Dov there, the Magad of Mezerich, said he said, understood everything that the Baal Shem Tov told. Rabbi Yaakov Yitzhak said he only understood a half. Menachem Mendel said he only understood a small part of the story, but he knew that the story included his going to Eretz Yisrael, so he knew he just wasn't going to die there in the Viteps. Okay. So, again, he made Aliyah in 1777, and on his way, he visited Yaakov, Yaakov um, Yosef in Polnoy, and as usual, he was dressed in silk and smoking a pipe, and Yaakov Yosef, Yaakov Yosef is the name, I'm sorry, I think I might have said Yaakov Yitzhak, I take that back, Yaakov Yosef. Please correct all your notes to Yaakov Yosef. So Yaakov Yosef's Hasidim didn't like the way Menachem Mendel was dressed, but when Menachem Mendel entered Yaakov Yosef's room, 
Yaakov Yosef rose and hugged, hugged him with enthusiasm and said to him, Yaakov Yosef said to him, do you now understand the Baal Shem Tov story? And Menachem Mendel said, I understand the entire story. Yaakov Yosef said, did you know that on the way to Eretz Yisrael, you were to visit me? And Menachem Mendel said, that's why I'm here. And Yaakov Yosef said, and where in the story are you currently holding? And it's, he said, it seems I'm halfway through. And after they spoke for a while, Yaakov Yosef accompanied Menachem Mendel to his inn. And of course, Yaakov Yosef's Hasidim were very curious to learn about who, this visitor, this unusually dressed visitor. Who is this guy? Okay, so Yaakov Yosef said, when the king decides to bury his most valuable jewel, he needs to find the most unexpected place to hide it. Menachem Mendel holds his humility dear. He holds his shiflut. We're going to speak more about shiflut dear. And he wishes to safeguard it from his Yetzirah. He got that. He didn't want his Yetzirah to be able to start working against his shiflut, against his humility. So he hides it in a behavior the Yetzirah would never suspect. A feigned display of arrogance. He attempted to mask his true modesty and humility to the Yetzirah couldn't find it. Okay, so this again was the first Hasidic Aliyah in 1777. <clears throat> so Menachem Mendel went, Avraham of Kalis went, and Yisroel of Polotsk. And they reached Eretz Yisroel on the 5th of El. So that's a little holiday, the first Hasidic Aliyah reached Eretz Yisrael on the 5th of El. They were all Hasidim, Hasidim of the Magid, who had died five years earlier, in, uh, who died five years earlier in 1772. They were all colleagues of the Alter Rebbe. The Alter Rebbe, who was the youngest of the Magid students, while well, Menachem Mendel was one of the oldest, saw Menachem Mendel as his teacher and Rebbe. And the Alter Rebbe didn't accept being Rebbe, didn't accept the Nesias till after Menachem Mendel had passed away in 1788. He considered him his teacher. Okay. So when they were leaving in 1777 to Eretz Yisrael, the Alter Rebbe initially accompanied the group until they reached Mogilev in the Ukraine. And then the, the Menachem Mendel instructed the Alter Rebbe to remain behind to serve as a leader of the Hasidim in Belarus and Lit in Lit Lithuania. And the Alta Rebbe labored to raise money for their support. As we said, there's all these letters in Tanya saying that we have to help the Hasidim in Eretz Yisrael. Very emotional. Now, Reb Pinchas of Koretz called Menachem Mendel of Ateps the king of Israel. So we'll get back to how he's the king in two ways. Menachem Mendel student, Elazar Zussman, gathered the words of Torah Menachem Mendel spoke on Shabbos into pre -haaretz. So the book itself was gathered by his student. Okay, so now we're getting to inner. Now we're getting to the exciting part of what it says on Gal Eina, inner.org. Now we're gonna find out the inner truth, the part that we've all been waiting for. Look at all these nice people here. Could a few more people put on their cameras, please come as you are. Come as you are, I'm coming with my candle, my earthside candle. <laughs> all right, that wasn't too successful, but I'm not gonna take it personally. Hi, everybody. Don't you wanna wave hi? Thank you, thank you, Peril, thank you, Bracha. All waves appreciated. Okay, so here we go. Now, if we'll to hear this part, Menachem Mendel of Ateps would sign his letters, the truly lowly, shiftless be'emet, the truly lowly. So an example of this is David HaMelech, when his wife Michal criticized him for wildly dancing among the common people when he was rescuing the Torah and bringing it back to Yerushalayim, Look, she was Shaul's daughter. She was the previous king's daughter. She grew up in royalty. She fell in this. She just said she'd marry. 
<laughs> she married a shepherd boy. What did he know about being a king? She felt she knew, she was the one who knew. So she didn't like that he was acting like just one of the people dancing in the crowd. But he said to her, I will be lonely in my own eyes, shiftless. Humility is the inner dimension of Malchus. We know that those 10 spheres, we've been talking about them a lot. So Malchus is the lowest one, which is royalty. And we, they all have an inner part. We know because Rav Yitzhak speaks about the inner part of each of the spheros and the inner part of Malchus is shiftless. So we're going to talk more about that. Now, Rav Yitzhak points out that lowliness can be a negative trait if a person doesn't respect himself. Oh, this is a very good part. We haven't really spoken about this, that lowliness can be a negative trait if a person doesn't respect himself the divine image within and allows himself to act like an animal. It's a heavy sentence, isn't it? So we want to avoid that. It never... <laughs> I'm laughing and crying at the same time, don't get me wrong. But the person we have to respect ourselves, the divine, Im and we have to respect the divine image within us. And if we have, so that's, if God forbid, God forbid, God forbid we ever find <laughs> So I was acting like an animal, I'm weeping. We have what's coming from not having enough self-respect for our divine image, okay. But lowliness can also be the best of traits. As we've spoken about many times, Pirkei Pir Abbas says, be very, very lowly, shiftless ma'od. The word ma'od is used. Remember we learned the whole, whole chapter that. Alter Rebbe divided, uh, devoted a whole chapter of Tanya, chapter 30, just speaking about shiftless. We've learned it many times, but it's like a really big deal to not feel better than other people. It's kind of a keynote in Hasidus, not to feel better than other people. Okay, so it could be the best of traits. However, we must recognize, so even though we're humble, on the one hand, we strive for humility, on the other hand, we have to recognize our strong points. And it's important to internalize that they're all a free gift from Hashem and his abundant kindness. Okay, we're not gonna do a 10 second meditation. Please think of, a, um, 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 recognize a strong point or talent that we have. Can everyone please think about a strong point or talent? that we have, and we're gonna spend 10 seconds trying to internalize that it's a gift from Hashem. Okay, go. Yes, is that successful? That it's a gift from Hashem? We could pick all kinds of interesting strong traits. <laughs> I happen to have just picked it. Someone just said on Shabbos that I have a, uh, what is that word? A contagious laugh. Now that's a big gift from Hashem. Today, because I'm, <laughs> I'm barely speaking, I'm not laughing as much as I usually do, but I think it's important to remember that every, all of our talents are a gift from Hashem. We shouldn't let our ego get involved. To see our talents as a gift from Hashem. This will help us be very humble. Okay, and the only way can we can perform a mitzvah is through Hashem's kindness. And this is, you know, when we're speaking about this idea, when we spoke about how to avoid what in Yiddish is known as es mir, it's coming to me. In English is called entitlement. How do we avoid that? Because if we do something good for someone and take credit for us, for it, we can come to believe that that person owes us something and we'll feel very disappointed. We're entitled and we're not getting what we're entitled to. So that's not a very useful way to go through life. But if we realize that Hashem did it, Hashem gave me the energy to do the mitzvah, Hashem gave me the situation, Hashem even gave me the motivation on a more subtle level. Then we give Hashem credit for the good that we do. We don't take credit. And then we never have to have the disappointment of feeling entitled. Okay. I spent a little thank you. Baruch Hashem. Okay, so. Mm -mm -mm. Yes. 
So Menachem Mendel taught the special connection between positive lowliness, hashafel be'emes. This is how, again, he signed his letter, hashafel be'emes, the truly lowly, and Eretz Yisroh. Because it says about humility, ma'od, shiftless ma'od, and it says about Eretz Yisroh, the land was very good, tov ma'od. So Eretz Yisroh is a great place <laughs> to practice humility. Okay, that makes sense. So we must be very careful not to think our own strength and talent brought us this success. This is very important in Eretz Yisroh. It's very interesting. It's one of the things like Paro says, my own strength and talent brought me this success. You know, the river is mine and I made it. So we mustn't think that, you know. You know, after the Six Day War, 1967, when Hashem helped us and there was a victory of biblical proportion and we reclaimed the, the, the heartland of Eretz Yisrael, Yehuda and Shomron, the, the Rebbe was weeping that already they decided to give it away, to throw it away because they didn't give Hashem credit. They thought it was my own strength and talent brought us why that's why we won the war. We're just smarter than our neighbors who lost the war. But it was very important to understand that it's a miracle, it was a miracle of biblical proportion and to give Hashem credit. So in Eretz Yisrael, it's very important to, not to think my own strength and talent brought me this success. Hashem did it. Yes. So from the leader of the first mass Aliyah, we learn the correct perspective to settle the land, which is that Hashem brought us this success. Well. Wow. From right here in Bad Ayin, Baruch Hashem, it's such a gift to be living here in Eretz Yisrael. Yay, 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 Baruch Hashem. Okay, so now what I'm going to end off with is a shear that you two can see live, like at least on Zoom, that Rav Yitzhak Ginsburg gave a few years ago in the shul of Menachem Mendel in Tveria. Okay, so we're going to end with Rav Yitzhak. But maybe before that, I'll just say something about visiting the grave, because Rav Yitzhak would go almost every year. This year, he wasn't able to go, but his chassidim are having a fabringen in the shul tonight, and davening that he should have a refu shalema. And we also, of course, have to daven that Rav Yitzhak Fivish ben Brina Malka should have a refu shalema, and the whole class should be on the merit. Because he would always go every year. There's a special Hasidic connection that we all have with Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk. So he's buried under a tree in the old cemetery in, in Tveria, under a very, 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 very big and shady tree. And everyone who's buried under the shade of that tree had the schus to see the holy face of Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk. And I had the schluss of being there with Shlomo and Olivia. But even before that, Olivia was telling me just today that before, now you could find the, the, the grave. It's like marked and you can see the tree. But the first time they went and they were looking for it, it was <laughs> like 110 degrees and it was very hard to find, but they didn't give up and they found it. And now <laughs> for all those who follow, it's not so hard to find, it's more, clearly marked. And if you're going to Tiveria, it's if you're driving from the south on the way into the city, you pass right by the cemetery and you can go and, and daven at his holy grave. Yes. So, okay. So this is, I, I was just, this was the last thing I listened to tonight live. It was, it's just eight minutes. I recommend seeing Rav Yitzhak say it, but I'll, I'll just tell you what I, I'll share with you what I heard. So everyone saw in Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk both elevation, Romamos Atzmid in Hebrew, and lowliness, shiftless, was a paradox. He was a walking paradox. Now that sounds interesting. He was Romamut Atzmid, elevated, and at the same time he was humble, so he's external. So his ex ex externality was like a king, but shiftless is the inner dimension of malchus, which is when you first hear it, it's a very unusual concept that to be a king 
You have to have the inner dimension of shipless. You can't add, even though there's all the outer dimensions of royalty, inside to be a king, one has to have shiftless, not feel better than other people. Isn't that kind of a mind blowing idea? Okay. So, shiftless is the inner dimension of Malchus. Chitsonius, externally, he, he acted like a king, but in his own eyes, he was like David Hamelech, Shafal Be'ena. David said about himself, I'm a worm and not a man. And Rabbi Yitzhak repeated this a few times, like this idea, a worm and not a man, it's in Tehillim. It's some, it is very humble <laughs> to see oneself as a worm. It's true. So that's a lot of humility. Okay. Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk said about one of his Hasidim, a few of his Hasidim, but one of them was Rabbi Itchula, that he should be the Rebbe. I should be his Hasid. I should travel to see him. He shouldn't travel to see me. But when Itchula, Rab Itchula entered his room, and Achimendel Batevsk sat like a king. So it was both. It was the shiftless. It's amazing that he was able to live with this unbelievable paradox of Romamus Atzmit on the outside and shiftless on the inside. So he's the Hasidic example of a king. Again, remember we said Pinchas of Korat said he was a king. He's the inner example of a king. Now, Tveria happens to be the second lowest city of an actual city in Israel. Only Yericho is lower, like the Dead Sea area is lower. But for a city, Tveria is the second lowest city in Israel. This is where we go down the mountains to get there. So the sages say, Mashiach will come from Tveria. So on the one hand, Menachem Mendel is a king. On the other hand, he's the Tachlis of Shiflis. And Hasidic groups and Rebbes in Europe would give money to the Shluchim who were collecting. They would also give gold and, gold and silver vessels to send back, to bring to him, to help support the Jewish community in Eretz Yisrael, the Hasidic community in Tiberia. So, he was recognized as the chief rabbi of Eretz Yisrael by the Hasidim, both in Eretz Yisrael and in Europe. Once Rebbeim in, in Europe sent Menachem Mendel of Atebsk, wait, now we could probably call him Menachem Mendel of Tiberia, many silver and gold vessels. When he received them, he put them on the window ledge and he said to Hashem, I give to you myself and all that is mine. Ich mit meiner, ich mit meiner. I and what's mine, I give to you. And he said it very slowly in Yiddish, ich mit meiner, I give to you. And as he said it, all witnesses say the vessels rose into the air. So we might <laughs> miss out on that fun miracle, but there are witnesses that saw it. So that's cool. So as he, so this is, so, so David HaMelech in Pirkei Avo says, I and all that is mine is yours and from your hand we give you. So this is very simple to, simple to what Menachem Mendel said. So he has a lot in common with David HaMelech. He has in common that outside external is Malchus. And the inside is utter humility, not feeling better than anybody. So that's the story. All right, so let's talk about the future now. So next week, and next week in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna continue finishing off the twinkle in your eye, which um, where we're, we're up to now, we're speaking about 10 mitzvahs that go with the 10 spheros. These are the 10 minutes, 10 mitzvahs that help with memory. We wanna do those mitzvahs. We're learning what they are and how do we remember them? We have a chart where we can stick each one by one of the spheros. And we all know the spheros by heart, yeah. especially now that we're counting Omer, right? So they're all, so we're gonna continue that. We're gonna finish that off. And then we're gonna start learning Rav Yitzhak's book, the, um, the divine space, 
which speaks about the six constant mitzvahs, the six constant mitzvahs, how they form a, the six sides around us, you know, like the six sides of a cube, front to back, the right, the left, up and down. So this, these six mitzvahs that are constant and they're obligated, all men, women, children, et cetera. So we're gonna learn about those. those. I really like that. That's very cool. We'll learn that and then we'll see what we'll learn after that. So we have to get back to that book. We got a little distracted by doing six classes on, six classes on Purim and a little something on Pesach, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I'm just gonna take a quick look at the chat here. Oh, okay, we missed that, did that. Okay, great. Okay, I think we got that done. And oh, we have 27 people. This is very, this is very cool having 27 people here. I'm very great, grateful to everyone who joined us, especially our first class back. I'm sorry about my voice. And I'm also sorry I'm not <laughs> I'm not as funny as I normally am this week because something about my voice like this is slowing down. So I have to apologize for the, the shortage of jokes. I'll really try to make up for it next Sunday night. I'm looking forward to all of you being there. So it's 9-11. Is Rabbi Ellie here yet? So there's four more minutes. Till, till we hear Rabbi Eli give us class. Oh, we want to take a picture to send to Rabbi Yitzhak for Rafua Shalema. Okay. Oh, I just got another. All right. It was nice to meet you too, Baraka. Could everyone now put on your cameras? Come on. We know that Rabbi Yitzhak is not in Tiberia, which means he does need a Rafua Shalema. So please get on that Rafua Shalema smile. And I'll take a picture. This is now I'm getting quite proficient. I shouldn't talk too much. I should be humble. Okay, so let's get that one, two, three. Come on, a few more people. Ruti, Bobby, Shifra, here's your chance for the Get Well card. <clears throat> one, two, three. No, I'll try again. One, two, three. Yes, it did it. Okay, I'm very grateful. I'm gonna send it off. I'm not gonna waste time. We're gonna get this off to Rav Yitzhak. Shavrufuah Shalem in this new month, Chodesh Tobit. And ER is, we know, all of Yud Yud Reish, Ani Hashem Rofecha, I am Hashem that heals you. So all of us and everyone should have a Rafua Shalema for everything. There should be miracles and wonders in every house. Thank you all so much for joining. It's really so nice to see you. Rabeli should be here in three more minutes. So see you all next week. Hugs and kisses. And again, love you all. Thanks so much. Call to.